in the first hour, <laughs> the funniest man in Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, CPA Ken Apple. Good morning, Ken. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, John. Good morning, Matt. You have brought with you a very funny tax form. <laughs> we were all looking at it and laughing while we were preparing to go on the air. I'm going to talk to you about tax policy in the state of West Virginia, the marriage penalty, uh, personal income tax cuts, all that good stuff too, Ken. But because you are a uh, senior advertiser to the radio station, I will let you pick the direction we go first because you are the funniest man in the county. Well, first, the first thing I brought with me is a Schedule M from West Virginia, and that's the form that you always ask me about every time I'm on the air. You ask me about what's that, that thing you always talk about, senior citizens missing. Yes, and this is the first <laughs> time you brought the form. Yeah, so there, I just thought I'd, I'd show you the actual form. So that's, yeah. that's on Schedule M, and down there towards the bottom of the form, it, it asks you what year you were born, and that's where you take your $8,000 exclusion for being over age 65. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also notice at the bottom of that form, it says that this form continues on page two. <laughs> they, they had to stretch that form, <clears throat> excuse me, to two pages uh, in order to accommodate all the modifications to federal adjusted gross income. Uh, the one that I have highlighted there says, uh, I want to deduct certain assets held by subchapter S corporation banks. Uh, so I can't tell you how many times <laughs> clients come into my office and say, Ken, uh, where do I deduct my certain assets that are held by an S corporation bank? I think there are two S corporation banks in the entire state of West Virginia. So why it needs its own line that they stretch this form to two pages, I have no idea. Uh, and then, of course, the other one that I highlighted is item 40. It says IRC 1341 repayments. So you want to make those? sure yeah. that you deduct those because, again, I can't tell you how many times people tell me where do I deduct my 1341. What are those? Good question. I have no idea. <laughs> this is your point. <laughs> but it's Internal Revenue Code 1341 if anybody wants to look it up. No, fair enough. Okay, and then I also brought you the instructions, this year's instructions to the West Virginia income tax returns. And what I wanted to highlight, because I, I've said it on the air two or three times, and I've had people question whether that was accurate or not. So I went ahead and brought the West Virginia instructions, and I highlighted the part where it says, who must file? And it says, and I quote, you are required to file a West Virginia return even though you may not be required to file a federal return. You have to file a West Virginia return if your West Virginia adjusted gross income is greater than your allowable deduction for personal exemptions, which is $2,000. So if you make more than two k, you have to file. Correct. Almost all of the other states that, that have an income tax have a provision that if you don't have to file a federal return, you also do not have to file a state return. West Virginia does not have that provision, and so there's thousands, maybe tens of thousands of returns being filed that have very, very little state income tax on them, but they have to be prepared, they have to be filed, the state tax department has to input those and uh, process payments and process refunds on very, very tiny tax returns. Now, it, it be, beneath where you have it highlighted in yellow, there's another paragraph that says you're not required to file a West Virginia return if you and your spouse are 65 or older and your total income is less than your exemption allowance plus the senior citizen modification. Yes. Can you put that in terms that any other human would be able to understand? Yes, and that is the $8,000 exclusion that I just pointed out on Schedule M. Okay. So if you're over age 65, you get an $8,000 exclusion in addition to your $2,000 exclusion. So in which case, then you should be getting a refund. In which case, you would not have to file a West Virginia tax return if your income did not exceed $10,000. Now, does that income include, say, Social Security and or other monies coming in, some form of, of a retirement? Or is that simply money that maybe you're doing a part-time job of some sort and, and bringing in some extra cash? Okay, so the answer, of course, is it depends. Um, <laughs> So West Virginia keys off of federal adjusted gross income. That's your starting point when you do your West Virginia taxes. And people who are collecting Social Security, some of them have some of their Social Security included in federal adjusted gross income. Some of them do not. So to the extent that your Social Security benefits were included in adjusted gross income, they count. 
towards this two thousand or eight thousand dollar limit. Okay, hold on. Another question though, you just said if I don't have to file a federal return, I may still have to file a state return, but yes. then said that the state return keys off of the federal adjusted gross income, yeah. so how do I determine that if I'm not filing? Yeah, so if you read on there, which Rob apparently has already read ahead, <laughs> it says if you didn't have to file a federal tax return, then you basically have to prepare one in order to do your West Virginia return. So I don't have to necessarily turn it into the federal government. Exactly. I just need to prepare it. Exactly. My favorite part of the instructions here, you must file a West Virginia income tax return if you are a resident of West Virginia for the entire taxable year, or you are a resident of West Virginia for a part of the taxable year, or if you were not a resident of West Virginia, <laughs> but you made some money. It's kind of like a wasted paragraph right there. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like everybody in the It really does. Has to file West it really return, does. Right? <laughs> Uh, so, no, you only have to file a non-resident return if you have income that is sourced from West Virginia. Uh, and, and Matt was asking me off the air about filing for multiple states, and I have quite a few clients that file in multiple states every year. Uh, because if you live in West Virginia but you own a rental property that's, say, in Maryland, <clears throat> you have to file a Maryland non-resident return and pay Maryland the income tax on the profit from that rental. So for the person who whose business is in Loudoun County, but they live in West Virginia, who's they're doing that's not West Virginia income, right? That or is it? Depends on how the business is organized. If if they were operating a sole proprietorship there, then yes, that would be taxed to the other state. But if you're a school teacher and you live in West Virginia but drive to Loudoun County for the larger salary. You, you, you do not owe income taxes to Virginia. You owe them to West Virginia, correct? That's correct. So all the contiguous states, uh, that is states that touch the border of West Virginia, they all have an agreement with West Virginia that says uh, when it comes to W-2 wages, you tax the people that live in your state, we'll tax the people that live in our state. But that doesn't apparently apply to athletes who, if you're a professional athlete, Let's say you're a baseball player and you, you play in 30 different cities throughout the course of the year. You, mm -hmm. uh, in, in many states, you owe a state and a local income tax to those locations. Uh, does that mean you get to deduct it from your own residency state? Okay, so let me explain the term contiguous again. Yeah. If they play in a state that is contiguous to the one that they live in, they don't have to pay tax in that state. Is that okay. uniform throughout the country? Yes. So if you fly across the country, if, if you're a New York giant or, and you fly to California to play, uh, those states are not contiguous, so they would owe tax to California on the money they earned playing in that particular game. I think that's a lame rule, by the way. That just makes more work for, so for accountants. <laughs> professional athletes uh, <laughs> normally file in 10 to 15 states each year, yes. Yeah. And, and they would file, what John pointed out, they would file a non-resident return in that state and say, here's how much money I earned in your state. Here's the tax on that money. And then they would do that in every, every non-resident state they played in. But then when you file your resident return in the state where you live, your resident state taxes you on your worldwide income 100%. So you would put all of that income on your personal return for the state that you live in, and you would calculate your tax as if you earned it all in that state. And then once you've calculated your tax, you would then take a credit against that state tax for each of the states that you paid tax to as a non-resident. So you only end up paying tax on, this, on the same income once, it's just paid to the various states where you earned it. So are accountants lined up outside of professional athletes' houses going, oh, pick me, pick me? I mean, this is, this is quite a, a windfall. Yeah. The, normally their agent picks their CPA, and they're usually big, whatever they are now, big six, big eight firms that do those returns. But, okay, how crazy can this get? If I'm a professional athlete and I end up on the injured reserve list, at the time that our team is taking that, you know, uh, three – uh, city tour out to the West Coast. So I don't actually play in those games, but I am still obviously on the roster and so forth. A am I still taxed, or do I actually have to physically be in the game? 
Excellent question. Uh, you, you, you definitely don't have to physically be in the game because all the guys that are dressed and ready to play that never get a chance to go in, they're still going to be taxed on whatever it is, one-sixteenth of their salary if there's mm-hmm. 16 games. Um, they do get paid extra money for all the playoff games. So the entire amount that you get paid for a playoff game is taxed in the state where you played the playoff game. But but somebody that's on injured re- reserve, if they travel with the team and they're still there, they're sitting there. I I don't know. This ends the professional athlete quiz. Yes. Part of well, wait, but not yet. How is that fundamentally different than you know? I write books that sell in in all fifty mm-hmm. states. One would hope, and um, or the the manufacturer of a piece of equipment that that manufactured in West Virginia and it's sold in Michigan. How is that fundamentally different than the guys getting on an airplane and and playing in the cities? Yes, yeah, so he he is physically there. You're not physically there writing the book. Okay. What if you travel to another state to sell books? If, let's say he goes. No, to a book I don't pay Michigan. taxes. I don't owe taxes. Yeah. <laughs> what if he goes to a book signing in Michigan? Yeah, that that doesn't come up for income tax, but it does come up for sales tax. So, which is why I never that that is why I never bring books to a book signing. It's always it's always the bookseller uh-huh. who handles the Take signing. Yourself so, out of the so I don't have to deal with that tax implications. <laughs> but he does accept cash for books on the sly. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ken, where are we going next? All right, so uh, you always like real life examples. So it's it's very early in the filing season, but I do have a couple of real life examples I thought you guys might be interested in. Uh, We'll take you back to 2020, and everybody knows what 2020 was famous for, right? Pandemic. Pandemic, right. So uh, when we got ready to file 2020 tax returns, there were an enormous amount of people who drew unemployment in 2020, many of whom had never drawn unemployment before because everything was shut down and, mm-hmm. and they drew unemployment. So very late in the game, in February of 2021, uh, the, IR, the uh, Congress, federal Congress, rushed through a bill saying we're not going to tax the first ten thousand two hundred dollars of unemployment that anybody earned last year well many people had already filed their tax return and paid tax on that unemployment and the irs said don't worry don't file an amended return if that's happened Uh, trust us we'll catch it and we'll send you your refund so a week or two after the federal government came up with that idea uh, the state of West Virginia took it up because they were in session, and they said, we're going to follow federal on this, and we're not going to tax the first 10200 either. But they didn't say, don't worry, don't file an amended return. <laughs> we'll figure it out and send you a refund. Uh, so I had a client that had already filed, and so taking the IRS's advice, we did not file an amended return. And sure enough, along about May or June, my client got a refund from the federal government. Uh, It, however, was not enough of a refund because all it was was the tax on the unemployment that was no longer taxable. Uh, What the IRS didn't take into consideration was that by lowering that client's income, it activated another credit that was available to him. So I did end up filing a, a federal amended return for him and got him some more money back to take that credit that he was now, it's a low income credit that he now was eligible for. And then we also filed the amended West Virginia return and said, uh, we've got some extra money here that you owe us because we paid tax on this unemployment that that you now have said is not taxable. Well, when that client had filed his original West Virginia return, he owed money with it because he was one of the people that, that there were millions of people in 2020 also that when their unemployment ran out, they chose to retire. He chose to retire and draw his Social Security after he finished drawing his unemployment. And, of course, the Social Security Administration will not withhold state taxes. So when we did his tax return, he owed taxes on his Social Security. Remember, this was 2020 before the phase-in started on the Social Security in West Virginia. So because he owed so much money with his West Virginia return, he owed a penalty for not having paid it as you go. And his penalty was $48. So that was included when he wrote his check with his original return. So when we amended the return and took this extra $10,200 off, it lowered his penalty from $48 to $34. And we filed the return, and we asked that the overpayment be credited to the next year rather than refunded because he was going to be in the same situation the next year. So he got a notice from the state of West Virginia very soon after we filed that amended return. And and I love the West Virginia notices because it comes and says, we changed your tax return. 
It doesn't acknowledge that, that you asked them to change the tax return. It just says, we changed it. And as a result, here's how much is, go is going to be credited to next year. And the amount they said was going to be credited to next year was $34 off of what we had asked them to credit. It was $34 more. And when I looked at it, I said, well, they, they didn't take the $34 penalty. So if they don't want the penalty, that's great. We're happy. About six months later, he gets another notice from the state of West Virginia that says, you owe us $34. <laughs> Gave it to me, and I said, well, that's the that same $34 that I said, just go ahead and pay it because they've credited an extra $34 to the next year anyway. So if you pay it, we'll be straight. So he paid it. A couple of months later, he gets another notice from the state of West Virginia. <laughs> so it says, we charged you a penalty, and we shouldn't have. So here's a refund check for $34. So what do I do with that? I said, just, just cash it. You know, it's not worth sending it back in. So he cashed it. And a couple of months later, he gets a certified letter demanding payment of $34. <laughs> and he sent the $34. You can't make this up. So last Thursday, I leave my office. No, there's no more. And I there go. Can't be more. I go home and get the mail out of my mailbox at my house, and I have a certified letter <laughs> notification from the West Virginia State Tax Department addressed to me. Uh, and I'm like, well, if there's a problem with my return, I'm going to fire my CPA. <laughs> I don't blame you. So the next morning, I go in and pick up my certified letter, and I open it up, and uh, they, have, they have determined that there was a difference be on my 2021 tax return, and the amount that I asked to be re uh, held over for 2022, they have reduced it by three dollars, and they sent me a certified letter to let me know that. <laughs> I don't know how much it costs to send a certified letter, but I'm guessing it's more than three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite the audit trail. <laughs> I, I was hoping you weren't going to say thirty-four dollars. No, the way. no, yeah. no. I hope that one's over, but but it never seems to be that the overpayment problems with West Virginia always continue for one, two, or three years before they get resolved. There were, a, a, my sister got one of these, uh, this was especially something during the pandemic that was confusing people, because checks would arrive from the IRS in fairly large amounts that you never requested, mm -hmm. never filed for, they just showed up. And then with my sister, it was a four-figure check that also contained a note that said, if you're not entitled to this, don't cash it or you'll be penalized. And she called me and she said, what am I supposed to do with this? I, I, was that fairly common? I, I remember texting you about that and asking for some advice on that. Yeah, so that all had to do with the stimulus payments. Uh, so there were four total stimulus payments. And some people were qualified for them, some didn't. And some people qualified for a lesser amount than what the stimulus check was. So you get these odd checks, you know, $980.20. And it's like, what in the world is this? And, of course, you obviously think it has something to do with the tax return that you filed, but it had nothing to do with that. It was just based upon your income. If your income was too high, you didn't get a stimulus check. But if it was in between two ranges, they reduced your stimulus check. And then you had to account for all that on the next year's tax return. And, and there are still nightmare stories about that that, that have never been resolved uh, because the, the IRS – takes the position that if they mailed the check out, they paid your stimulus. If you never got it because you moved, and it says right on the envelope that it's not forwardable, so it went back to the IRS, they don't acknowledge that they got the check back. They don't check and see whether it was cashed. They just say, we sent you one out, therefore, as far as we're concerned, you got it. So we file a tax return and claim we didn't get it, and they deny the claim. So somebody has to reconcile the bank account at the IRS before those people will actually get their stimulus checks from two years ago. Good luck on that. Wow. Okay. I've got about uh, three minutes until we take the next break. Do you have a, a quick one you want to work in? Yeah, so last story this year, I had, had a, a new client walk in the door, and uh, he brought me his f four years prior year's tax returns. Uh, he lives in Martinsburg. He has an address in Martinsburg. That address was on all four years' tax returns. Uh, every piece of information that he gave me to prepare the return from had a Martinsburg address on it. Uh, when I looked at his prior year returns, 
all of his prior year returns said that he filed a non-resident West Virginia return rather than a resident return. I'm going, well, that's peculiar. So I called him and asked him about it, and he said, no, I'm a resident of Florida. I said, okay, how do you figure? Well, he has a Florida driver's license. His wife has a West Virginia driver's license. He has West Virginia tags on all of their cars. Uh, they're over 65. They live in a house that's class two in the county, and they're eligible for the homestead exemption. But he's been claiming for years that he's a non-resident of West Virginia and not paying West Virginia taxes. And nobody's ever asked a question about it. So for this year, he's filing a resident return, or at least I'm preparing a resident return for him. So I just found that peculiar that there's nobody in the state tax department looking at a non-resident return that has a West Virginia address on it and not asking any questions. And he was getting the homestead exemption, too. Yes. Which would appear to be evidence of having a homestead. Uh, it's evidence to me. <laughs> well, you burst his bubble, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah. Is, is his tax liability going to be more living in West Virginia than it would be in Florida? Uh, since Florida does not have an income tax, <laughs> yes, substantially. And then... Uh, doesn't change anything else. And, and, you know, just the states get you different ways. If you live in Florida, maybe you pay a tax that you don't pay in West Virginia. Right. And, and it, it just seems peculiar to me that, and I know that this is true, but you can walk into the West Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles with a Florida driver's license and title a car in West Virginia and tag a car in West Virginia. It seems like someone should catch that along the way. Is you that what would, you're implying? You would think so. <laughs> I told you he was the funniest man in accounting, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't let us down. CPA Ken Apple in studio with us. Uh, when's tax deadline day this year, Ken? Tax deadline day is actually on April 18th this year. Uh, April 15th falls on a Saturday, so it would normally be due on Monday the 17th. But Monday the 17th is Patriots Day. So it's not actually due until Tuesday the 18th this year. The state of West Virginia is considering what level of personal income tax cut to enact this year, or if it takes too long, maybe next year. Uh, last fall, the debate was personal property tax or personal income tax. That seems to have been settled into personal income tax, we think. And when discussing competitiveness of state tax rates, the elected officials we interview frequently cite our neighboring states as a way of being competitive what they are charging. Now, during one interview, somebody cited a Maryland state income tax rate, which I knew for a fact was way too low because I know I pay Maryland state income taxes. And you sent me a quick text to verify my thought process on that one there, uh, which made me wonder if in Charleston they actually have all the information they need to make an intelligent decision on what is a competitive tax rate or not. So let's get into the comparison of the states here, Ken. Right, and and so uh, what that rate that gets quoted in Maryland is, is is that their top rate is 5.75%. In fact, it was printed in our local paper last week. Uh, they had a comparison of all the states, and they said Maryland was at 5.75%. It is not. And it, it the, the state rate is 5.75%. So let, let's talk about how the states do their income tax. Most states, like West Virginia and Virginia, the state collects all of the state income tax. It all goes to the state capital, and then they divvy it up to the counties and cities based on whatever formula they come up with. Maryland doesn't do it that way. In Maryland, when you file your tax return, you tell them what county or city you live in, and there's a piggyback tax that goes right on top of the state income tax. And in most counties in Maryland, it's right around 3%. It can vary from 28 to 3.2%, but for talking purposes, we'll say it's 3 So if you want to talk about the top tax rate in Maryland, it's not 5 and 3 quarters, it's 8 and 3 quarters. Uh, and it just makes it easy for the state when they get your money. They, they already know exactly how much money goes back to your county because it's been piggybacked on there. In the state of Pennsylvania, they actually have a whole separate bureaucracy to, to collect the, the local tax. So the rate that you see quoted for Pennsylvania is 3.07%. And again, that's what was in the paper last week. Uh, but all of the counties in Pennsylvania, and some of them are subsets of counties, have a taxing bureau that you actually have to file a local income tax return with, and they charge another 1% on any earned income which is basically your W-2 income or your 
sole proprietorship income. So really the Pennsylvania rate is not 3.07, it's 4.07. So when you're talking about these rates, you have to have a little bit more knowledge than looking something up on the internet and looking at a state rate. And, and in fact, I'll have employers, every once in a while I'll have an employer in West Virginia that employs somebody from Maryland, and as a convenience to that employee, they register with the state of Maryland to withhold Maryland taxes on them. On them. And they'll go to the state chart and withhold the state rate, and then when that person files their tax return, they owe a ton of money to Maryland because they only withheld the state portion and they didn't withhold the local portion. And Virginia, I don't think you mentioned Virginia. And Virginia does the same thing as West Virginia. They, they just have the one state rate, you send it to the state, they, they send it back to the counties according to whatever formula they have. Uh, so because of what you mentioned, I'm going to jump to my item seven on your, on your uh, outline. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, all I'm doing today uh, for this is asking questions, and that question is, would you rather have an income tax cut or not pay personal property taxes? Everybody in your listening audience is going to have a different answer to that. Half of them will say, I'd rather have a state income tax cut, and the others will say, I'd rather not pay the personal property tax. And it all depends on what you're driving, basically. Mm -hmm. If you're driving old cars and you're paying a very low personal property tax, you'd rather have an income tax cut. If you've got a new four-wheel drive, you may be paying more personal property tax on that truck than you are on your house. So you might rather have a personal property tax cut. And I know you're going to have the governor on following me, uh, so if you get to ask him any questions, I would like to, to know where the governor stands. Uh, when he was going across the state, he came up here, he went to Spring Mills, and emphatically asked everyone to vote against Amendment 2, which would enable the legislature to mess with personal property tax. And he said, basically, you can't trust them, trust me. He said, what I'm going to do is create a credit to your income taxes for the exact amount of personal property tax that you paid, and I'll get you your personal property tax back that way. I haven't heard him say anything about that since. So now he's got this huge proposal to drop the personal income tax by 50% over three years, but where's my credit for the personal property tax that I paid? Once Amendment 2 was defeated, I never heard him talk about it again. So if you're relatively low income in West Virginia, which let's face it, half of the state is, mm -hmm. uh, those people are paying way more in personal property tax each year than they are in total state income tax. So if they're paying $500 in personal property tax and $300 in personal income tax, a 50% cut in their personal income tax is only going to be worth 150 bucks to them where if you got rid of the personal property tax, it'd be worth $500 to them. So I don't know what happened to that discussion. It all disappeared. And if you ask any of the politicians now, they'll say, well, the people have spoken. They didn't want to cut in their personal property tax, so we're moving on. But what happened to the governor's promise that if you defeat Amendment 2, I'm going to give you a credit on your personal income tax for the property tax you pay? I'd be interested to hear his response to that. Mm -hmm. So my first question today for your listening audience is, how much should a person earn without paying any federal or state income taxes on it? Is that number zero? If you earn $10, should the government get some of it? Or is there some limit? Maybe it's $100,000. If I make less than $100,000, I shouldn't pay any personal income tax. So I did some research with the federal government and the surrounding states to see what they thought. And the federal government says if you're under age 65, that number is $13,000. So you pay no federal income tax on your first 13000 of income if you're under 65. And you don't even have to file a tax return. And some of the states follow that. So any state, for instance, I talked about earlier that if a, if a state says you, if you didn't have to file a federal return, you don't have to file a state return. Maryland says that. So Maryland agrees with the 13000 and Virginia agrees with the 13000 However, in West Virginia, as we said at the top of the program, that number for someone under age 65 is $2,000. You have to file a tax return and K-1 
calculate a state income tax on your income if you make more than two thousand dollars well that's not very tax friendly that's not tax friendly and if you're in pennsylvania where everyone touts their flat tax and their low flat tax which we now know is 4.07 percent instead of 3.07 percent you have to file pennsylvania return and pay tax if your income's over 33 dollars 33 33 dollars and the way they came up with that is if you take 3.07 percent of 33 that's when you get one dollar so if you owe them less than a dollar god bless them you don't have to pay it <laughs> that's awesome but if you make so if you only made 25 dollars last year you don't have to pay any pennsylvania income tax but if you made 33 dollars or more you do so everybody has their own opinion on how much you should make but uh, the consensus among the federal government and most states is that that number is about thirteen thousand dollars per person. In West Virginia, it's two thousand. So again, when you're talking about tax rates, would you rather pay six and a half percent tax on a small portion of your income, or four point zero seven percent on all of your income? You might very well get the same answer. So the tax rates are misleading. Now the bottom rate for income taxes in West Virginia, as I understand it, is 1% on the $2,000. Is that the bottom rate on the other states as well, at the $13,000? Uh, so Pennsylvania has a flat tax, so there are no tax brackets in Pennsylvania. It's 3.07% on the first dollar and the last dollar. All the other states have a graduated income tax, but the, the graduations are so small it's not even worth talking about. So in West Virginia, you get to the top rate at 60000 mm -hmm. In Maryland, you get to the top rate at 17000 So I've, I've, that's actually my next topic. But I promise I didn't read ahead. <laughs> okay. So my next question would be, once we've established how much you have to make in order to pay any taxes at all, what rate should you pay? So the federal government says if you're over that $13,000 limit we talked about, on the next 10,000, we're only going to tax you at 10%. And then it goes up to 12, to 22, and to 24%. Is 24 the top federal rate right now? 24 is not the top federal rate, but it is for our listening audience. Okay. Okay. That's well over 150,000 of income per person. Mm -hmm. So that would be 300,000 for a married couple. Uh, there, yeah, there's, there's a top rate of 37%. We all wish we were in that top tax bracket. In Maryland, you can. There, this answers your question, John. In Maryland, uh, with the piggyback tax, their bottom tax rate is 7.75%. And it is graduated, but it goes to 8.75%. So it's really not worth talking about the brackets in between because they move up by a quarter of a percent. Mm -hmm. In Virginia, they only have two brackets. They have 5% on the first 17,000 and five and three quarters on everything over that. So it's pretty easy to get to the top tax bracket in Virginia. In West Virginia, our bottom tax bracket is not 1%, it's 3. 3% is the lowest tax in, in West Virginia. And it goes from 3 to 6.5, but you get there by the time you have $60,000 worth of income. And as we said in Pennsylvania, it's a flat tax, so there are no graduated rates. When I Go ahead, Matt. I was just going to say, again, those numbers in West Virginia haven't changed in how many years? Okay, so I'm not exactly sure how many years, but the tax rate schedule that I consult has been in my desk drawer since 1993. So the rates have not, you know, if they thought you should hit the top tax bracket only when you hit $60,000 worth of income in 1993... I would think that you wouldn't hit the top tax bracket in 2023 until well over that. I think we looked that up last time you were on. It's like 128,000 equates. I think you did, yeah. So it's about double that. But they've never been adjusted for inflation. Uh, so on your next page, it, Bill Clark kind of leads us into that when he says, doesn't Pennsylvania exempt retirement when it comes to income taxes? Because this next page kind of looks like where's the best state to retire? Yeah, so now my next question is, is there any type of income that is taxed by the federal government that you don't think should be taxed by the state. The three things I could think of, one was Social Security benefits, okay? 
Maryland does not tax Social Security benefits, period. Virginia does not tax Social Security benefits, period. Pennsylvania does not tax Social Security benefits, period. West Virginia, it depends. On? On your level of income. So West Virginia passed a law three years ago, it's fully phased in now, that says we're not going to tax your Social Security benefits if your federal adjusted gross income was less than $50,000 for an individual, $100,000 for a couple. If it was over that, we are going to tax them. And there's no phase in, it's a cliff. So if you're a, if you're a married couple at 99999 you don't pay tax on your Social Security benefits. If you made $2 more than that, you do on all of them, not just, it's not phased in. It's expensive, two bucks. So when you, when you consult these websites about, you know, the best place to live for tax policy and whatever, if you look at Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, they will tell you that they don't tax Social Security benefits. They don't say that for West Virginia because if you're, if you have a, a normal part uh, income, they do. All right, what about pension income? And now when I say pension, I'm talking about a qualified pension. I'm talking about a federal pension, a state pension, or or what they used to call a defined benefit pension plan from a private employer. I'm not talking about individual retirement accounts, that kind of thing. I'm talking about an actual pension that comes from the place that you used to work at. Pennsylvania does not tax any of those, zero. Virginia does, West Virginia does, and in Maryland, it depends. On? Maryland has a pension exclusion that they have adjusted for inflation each year that says up to this amount of your pension is not taxable, but you have to use that against your Social Security benefits first. So if your Social Security benefits are high enough, you actually do pay on your pensions in Maryland. If your Social Security benefits are low enough, you don't pay on pensions in Maryland. And West Virginia is a flat out? Flat out, yes, unless you were one of the fortunate people that they picked as a winner and put a special exemption in the law for you, which would be military retirement, railroad retirement, uh, law enforcement, and firefighters pensions. And then the last item is is those distributions from IRAs and, and other retirement accounts that you've put away for yourself. Uh, Pennsylvania, again, does not tax any of that. Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia all do. So in Pennsylvania, if you have a, a traditional IRA, they don't tax the, the distributions? Yeah, Pennsylvania does not tax any form of retirement income. Sweet. PA, here we come, baby. <laughs> However, while you're working in Pennsylvania, before you retire, you pay tax on more of your income than you do in all the other states because your deferrals into your 401k, you don't get a deduction for those in Pennsylvania because they're not going to tax it when you take it out, so they don't let you deduct it when you put it in. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, are there any expenses that you pay that are deductible for federal purposes that you think should be deductible for state purposes? And the first one is my pet peeve which I'm going to call catastrophic medical expenses. Mm-hmm. Here, by catastrophic, I'm talking about nursing home care, basically. So if you're confined to a nursing home and you're paying $15,000 a month for nursing home care, uh, the federal government says you get a tax deduction for that. That's going to wipe out your income, and you're not going to pay any federal income taxes. I don't know about you or the listening audience, but I think that's appropriate. If I'm paying $180,000 a year to a nursing home, which is well beyond my income, I don't think I should be paying any taxes anymore. Are those deductible in Maryland? Yes, they are. Are they deductible in Virginia? Yes, they are. Are they deductible in Pennsylvania? No, they have a flat tax. Are they deductible in West Virginia? Absolutely not. So you can be in a nursing home be paying the nursing home twice what your salary is, West Virginia still wants a piece of your salary as taxes. How about large charitable contributions? The federal government allows you to deduct those. Define large. Uh, In excess of your standard deduction. So the standard deduction is that 13,000 we were talking about. Mm -hmm. 
So if you give away $20,000 worth of charitable contributions, the federal government will let you deduct that. So will Maryland. So will Virginia. Pennsylvania has a flat tax, so no. West Virginia, no. No deduction for those charitable contributions. And West Virginia is not setting up as a very tax-friendly state. Yeah, so when you're talking about these tax rates, yeah, Maryland might have a higher tax rate, but if they let me take deductions that, Pennsylvania, that West Virginia doesn't, I may still end up paying less taxes in Maryland than I do in West Virginia, even your, though the your, rate's higher. Your net tax rate. Because I'm paying a higher rate on a lower yeah. number. Yeah. Okay. Now, should the amount of state income taxes you pay be based upon your marital status? Everybody has their own opinion on that. Uh, back in the 1940s and 50s, when most state income taxes were being thought about, uh, there was a bias towards married people. So traditionally back then, the husband worked, the, the wife stayed home and took care of the kids and cooked and cleaned, right? So they let the married couple pretend like mom made half of the income even though dad made all the income, and that lowered their taxes. Today, I may have two or three clients that are married and both spouses don't work. I mean, that's just the way it is today. Both spouses work. So if both spouses are working and making approximately the same amount of money, there can be a marriage tax. So in Virginia, they have accounted for that. So Virginia makes no distinction as to whether you're married or single. You get the same amount of exemptions, and the tax brackets are the same no matter what. Pennsylvania, same way, because they got a flat tax. All right. Maryland has a slight benefit if you're married. It's not much of one, but they're basically, they don't care if you're married or you're not married, but they do give you a slight benefit for being married. In West Virginia, it's the opposite. In West Virginia, you pay more taxes if you're married than you would if you were two single people living together. Significantly different? Significantly different, yeah. If if both, if the married couple makes over 120000 they pay about $2,000 a year extra state income taxes just because they have a piece of paper saying they're married. Sorry, honey. So I, <laughs> so I say all that to say what I've said on here before. If you think the West Virginia state income tax law as it is right now is perfect, clearly I do not, then if you want to do a tax reduction, an across-the-board tax reduction is the way to go because we already have a perfect state income tax law. If you don't think it's perfect, which I don't, then I think you ought to work on these things first, and that's where I say that's getting into the hard work that obviously the, the, the House of Delegates has not done that hard work. They've just sent over to the Senate this across the board reduction and as Craig Blair said the other day give them some time to work on it because hopefully the Senate which I've shared this with is looking at hitting some of these what I consider to be unfair provisions before they do an across the board cut but don't we doesn't the math kind of since everything tees off of the rates if if we go from 6.5 to three and a quarter down to a point and a half for the the lowest rates and then everything keys off of those numbers don't we sort of get there with the, i mean all of the the impacts of call it unfairness whatever uh, marriage penalty and all that doesn't that reduce if there's a 50 percent reduction in everybody's rate does it mitigate some of these unfair parts of yes the tax thank law? you yeah so the two thousand translator yeah i know so the two thousand dollar marriage penalty is now a thousand dollar marriage marriage penalty it's still marriage penalty it's still a thousand bucks a year mm -hmm. uh, and and the low income person who is barely above the two thousand dollar filing limit who's only paying let's say a hundred dollars of state income taxes now he still has to file a tax return and pay his fifty dollars Okay, Let's so, get those people off the tax rolls, and that'll be an efficiency in government. The state tax department will have tens of thousands less tax returns to even fiddle with. The Senate has said, in the form of uh, Ryan Well, Jason Barrett, Craig Blair, the senators we've interviewed, that they are seeking the advice of tax professionals on how to better craft a tax system and tax breaks in West Virginia. You say you've sent this along to the Senate. Was that by request? Did someone ask no. for your help or you just volunteered it? No. 
Has, no, any, I, has I, anybody in the Senate reached out to you or anybody you know as a CPA and said, come in and give us some tax expertise on what we're doing wrong? Uh, Charles Trump has asked me for information, which I provided to him. Uh, and, recently? Uh, recently. And Mike Hornby has. That's the only two elected officials that have asked me my opinion on anything. All right. So are you aware of any other CPAs whose opinions and expertise has been actively sought by the Senate while they gather expert information? I wouldn't. No, I'm not, but I wouldn't expect to know. Okay. Well, that's what they say they're doing. They're gathering up information so they can better craft a tax bill that makes more sense. And I hope that's what they're doing. Well, hope is not what we want right now. We want (laughs) people who know the tax code better than elected officials to actually get in there and fix stuff. Hope ain't the way to fix. (laughs) Right. I agree. We want something done because we're looking at excess all the time. The state is constantly coming out. We've collected more. We've collected more. We've got all of this. Our rainy day funds are chocked full. The barns are full. and, And people are looking going, okay, something has to give. And, and it's not us. <laughs> it's time that you give well, and, back. Well, and there's a history here of paralysis through analysis, right? right? Mm-hmm. We, you just, we, we think, and well, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's make sure that this is the right way. And then nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, if they were phasing this down to 100% elimination of the income tax, then all the stuff I talked about this morning, I would just wave it and say, well, if, it, if the whole thing's going away, then it doesn't matter. Which they say is the ultimate goal. Never going to happen. Which is the reason why they want to raise sales taxes as a way of offsetting some of the income tax. That's the only way the state of West Virginia can eliminate the personal income tax is to raise another tax somewhere. Mm -hmm. Probably sales tax. April 18 is or 17. April April 18 Mm -hmm. is the new April 15 this year. And uh, when's the kind of soft deadline for you to stop seeing new people this year? April 1st. April 1. And after that, if they contact you, it's extension time? I'd be glad to file them an extension request. An extension means? Extend the time to file the tax return, but it does not extend the time to pay the tax. Because they got to have that money now. We need that surplus. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, how do people get in touch with you for more information about their taxes? You can reach me today at 304-263-1100. If you call that number, I'll know you're calling because you heard me on WRNR. And TV10. Ken, thank you very much. Thank you. CPA Ken Apple, the funniest man in accounting.